Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 10 is where we are going to begin. Mark chapter 8. You can stand as you're finding your place. And I'll do a little review even before we actually read the text. As you probably remember, last week in our text in Mark, a miracle occurred. Four thousand men were fed, not counting, according to Matthew, women and children. So we've got a multitude. We've got at least ten to 15,000 people fed from a few loaves and fish. And in this miracle that appeared nearly the same as one that came before, Jesus illustrated a new lesson about himself. Do you remember what that lesson was? No matter the level of man's desperation or the size of his need, where man can do nothing, Christ can do anything that God can do. That was the message last week. The title of the message was, what can... What are we supposed to do, right? Where man can do nothing, Christ can do anything that God can do. If feeding a multitude of Gentiles with a few loaves and fish said anything, it said Jesus is the only source of satisfaction for all of men's needs because he is unquestionably the Son of God. Right? If that miracle said anything at all, if you're going to look at the miracle of Jesus feeding tens of thousands of people with a few loaves and fish, and not just his own people, not just his own uh, uh, Jewish uh, nation, and not just his own disciples, but Gentiles included, if that says anything about who Jesus was, it says this, he is God and he can supply the needs of all men. Does it not? An amen is appropriate there. It certainly does. Well, this was act one in a three-act lesson. How many remember that we were going to cover three acts? Does anyone remember that? Oh, good, you were listening. That was act one in a three-act lesson. A lesson that highlights just how slow men are to recognize and retain who Jesus is. That's what this lesson is about. And it began with one of the most obvious demonstrations of Christ's divinity recorded in Scripture, the feeding of 4,000. I mean, that's really obvious, right? If you're reading that and you had any idea, who, in, who is this Jesus? Oh, he must be the Son of God. That's what that, that miracle is supposed to do. But this whole lesson, this three-part act, if you will, that Mark lays out demonstrates how we are so slow to recognize that truth. This account has a deliberate and familiar parallel as well, does it not? As you're standing here, I have forgotten you're standing. Just stay with me just a minute longer. Can you think of another time in Scripture where people might have wandered into wilderness and forgot what God was capable of doing? Does that ring a bell? Sounds like the Old Testament. Sounds like the children of Israel leaving three days into the wilderness. It was three days. Three days after he parted the Red Sea and they, they were afraid they were going to die of thirst and starvation as if God couldn't provide. That's not an accident as Jesus feeds the multitudes again in the wilderness. Like the children of Israel three days in their wilderness journey, we too easily forget what God can do and fail to recognize His miraculous working in our life for what it is. We're just like that. We're just like that. I hate to say it. We're just like that. Apparently, we are still just as slow to recognize the obvious hand of God and few accounts could illustrate that better than the text before us. Here's act two. So here you have it. Jesus feeds the multitudes. Miracle. How many baskets this time? Does anyone remember? How many baskets? Seven baskets. A few small uh, 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 loaves and fish. Seven baskets full. At least 10,000 people fed to the full. Wow. Obvious. Miracle. 
Now let's look how well they got it. Okay, now let's read. Let's, let's read in verse 10. We're going to read down through verse 21. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came to the parts of uh, Dalmanu, Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. Seek, did, were they not paying attention? <laughs> seeking a sign, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, and entering into a ship, again departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. <laughs> and when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Be perceive ye not, neither, under, uh, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes ye see not, having ears hear ye not? And do ye not remember? When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets of fragments took ye up? And they say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? Well, that's not much better than the Pharisees. Jesus performs a very obvious miracle. Two of them, in fact, that he references here, almost identical, feeding 5,000 men and women and children included, and then feeding 4,000 men and then women and children included with baskets full each time. And for some reason, they get in a boat without any bread and they think they're in trouble. They get in a boat with Jesus... And they think Jesus is upset because they didn't bring enough bread. And then the Pharisees have the audacity after the miracle to say, we'll believe you if you show us a sign. Have you ever heard the phrase, hear no evil, see no evil? This is a message titled, hear no miracle, see no miracle. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father... I thank you for your word and I thank you, God, <clears throat> that you are patient enough to teach us when we cannot see the things we should see. And you show us why we can't see these things and you can help us overcome them. Father, if there be any here who struggle with their perception of you, I pray this morning we could clear that up in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It's a bad day when you're one of Christ's hand-picked disciples and you share the same spiritual problem as the Pharisees. Christ's outspoken opposition, right? That's a bad day. <laughs> That's a bad day when your problem is the same as those who totally reject Jesus. They, things aren't good. It's a bad day. They were blind, Jesus said to his disciples. They were deaf. They were hard-hearted. They could not see what they ought to see, and they were no different than the Pharisees themselves. Clearly both have a problem with their perception of Jesus, but they arrived at that problem from different angles. They came from different places. So the question of the text is why, right? What prevents Pharisees and disciples from seeing Jesus clearly? What, 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 let's just reduce it down to what prevents us from seeing Jesus clearly? Why is it so hard for them to see what should be so obvious? Now we're like Paul Harvey. We have the rest of the story. So don't think that you're so 
special in that you can see what they cannot and pat yourself on the back too soon. Because if you were in their same shoes, it's likely you might think the same way. But we know the rest of the story. We can see what's happening in context. But how in the world can you see the miracles of Jesus? Can you see his hand of, at work and miss it so, so, so terribly? I mean, they, they totally missed it. They totally missed it. What prevents us from seeing Jesus clearly? Well, the first thing that happens is Jesus gets into a boat after the miracle and they go <clears throat> uh, to a city where they meet the Pharisees and they discover this lesson. One of the things that prevents us from, Jesus see, uh, from seeing Jesus clearly is desiring more than faith offers. If you want to know what would prevent you from seeing Jesus clearly, it is this. Desiring more than faith offers. The Pharisees expected more than what faith offered. Now, first, the first thing they asked for is a sign from heaven. Do you guys see that in the text? Now, it's interesting in doing a little study of that and reading a little uh, closely. You notice they don't just ask for any sign. They say, I want a sign from heaven. And you might ask, well, what, what's so significant about that and that phraseology? Well, Signs by their very nature come from God, right? Uh, so the phrase, a sign from God, is redundant. You, you wouldn't say, I want a sign from God. If you ask for a sign, they can only come from God. Or as the uh, Pharisees accused Jesus from, from Beelzebub, right? So they've got to come from a supernatural source. So if you have a sign, it, it's already assumed it comes from God. So what do you mean by a sign from heaven? Well, the Pharisees specifically asked for a sign, not from earth, but from heaven. It's as if they said, okay, so you can show us some pretty astounding earthly miracles, like feeding the 5,000. I'll grant it, it's pretty impressive. You've done something amazing here on earth, now show us a sign from heaven. It's as if what Jesus was doing was not enough until he could prove themselves by having God intervene as if God wasn't intervening, right? What are they asking? You want a sign from heaven? <clears throat> the Pharisees were not looking for a display of power as much as they were looking for some evidence that would prove the source of the power. It wasn't as if they were looking at the miracle of either feeding of the multitudes and thinking, well, that's not quite enough. They recognized there was power. They wanted proof that that power came from God. Really, they wanted proof. But Jesus came to call people to faith. He did not come to give us proof. He came to give us evidence that is, that is uh, sufficient for faith. And Jesus is here performing the miracle. They ask for a sign, but the only thing they got from heaven is a sigh. Jesus sighed deeply. He looked at that, and it's, it's, it's sad the way he responds. But it, he, he looks at them, and it, and it says uh, in verse 12, And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. He sighed deeply in disappointment. He heard their request and he sighed deeply. Now, now he might be thinking, okay, now, now why, why sigh, right? He just fed 5,000 and then 4,000 and he's done many other miracles. They're asking for a sign. Why not, why not just give them one? Well, what Jesus sighed at was their motive. Instead of accepting what he did to prompt their faith, they wanted proof. They wanted proof. Do you know they already had a sign from heaven? I mean directly from heaven. They wanted a sign from heaven of who Jesus was. Jesus was that very sign. He came from heaven. He came to be born of men. He fulfilled prophecy when he was born of a virgin in a stable, in a manger in Bethlehem. 
just as the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah predicted. That's exactly what God said would happen. He came from heaven. The very hosts of heaven, the angels, announced his arrival. Said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This is Emmanuel. That's God with us. He was the sign from heaven. He was that very sign. Jesus was truly the sign who had come from heaven, but they had no appreciation for him. And if any generation in the history of the world was privileged with heavenly evidence of Christ, it was this generation. I mean, you and I can come up with excuses, and we hear them all the time from people that say, well, I really want God to, to, to verify himself to me. If he can just prove he is who he says he is, then I'll believe. Friend, if they didn't believe, no one today is going to believe with proof. God provides evidence. But the minute you get proof, you eliminate the need for faith. And he came on the condition of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So Jesus sighed because they wanted proof. They were a privileged generation. They had all the evidence they needed right from heaven. But they would not believe. And so in the next few verses, as Jesus gets in the boat in verse 13, uh, 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 verse 13, and he left them and entered, entering into a ship, Again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Beware of leaven. Now before we wrap up this first point, this point on what prevents us from seeing Jesus clearly, desiring more than faith offers, desiring proof, faith does not offer proof. As we get to the end of this point, Jesus makes this comment. He's in, he's in the boat. He dismisses the Pharisees. He gets in the boat. And he's heading across the sea once again with his disciples. And as he's musing about what just happened, he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Now, those are interesting bedfellows. What do Pharisees and Herod have anything to do with each other? I don't know if you know anything about those two groups, but they don't fit very well. <laughs> they, they don't go together so much. No, Pharisees, if they were anything, they were very religious, right? They were very religious. And Herod, if he was anything, was very pagan, very non-religious, very secular, very worldly very godless. They don't appear to have anything in common on the surface, but they do share one poisonous fault that can infect others like leaven, and that is this. Their obstinate refusal to believe in spite of the evidence. Their obstinate refusal to believe in spite of the evidence. Neither party, neither the Pharisees nor Herod, or the Herodians, those who followed him, would admit the truth, let alone embrace it, even when it stared them in the face. Look at chapter 6, if you will. Just turn back real fast. Chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. The Bible says this. And King Herod heard of him, that be Jesus, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do... And therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Wait a second. <clears throat> Did Herod see the signs and hear about them that Jesus performed? Yeah, enough to believe that it was John the Baptist risen from the dead. So they had to be pretty convincing signs. What Herod had heard of Jesus was, was some pretty significant evidence. Well, what did Herod do with that? Did God give Herod light to believe? Did he give him 
the evidence in order to trust God by faith through Christ. Yes, he did. He absolutely did. But Herod wanted more. He refused to believe in spite of the evidence. And you know what? So did the Pharisees. Though they were completely religious, completely apart from Herod, Herod rejected God because he didn't want to give up his worldliness and he didn't want to give up his uh, uh, lascivious, lustful lifestyle. He didn't want to do that, so he rejected God for those reasons. But the Pharisees, though they were religious, still demanded the same thing. They wanted proof. They refused to accept, to believe in spite of the evidence. The Pharisees insisted that Jesus provide proof before they will commit themselves to believe. And Jesus, in the boat, musing and thinking out loud, said to his disciples, I want you to, be, to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. This kind of faithless thinking, it spreads like leaven. Slowly and quietly and affects everything it touches. We have to remind ourselves it's not always just the enemies of God that think faithlessly. Even the people of God, even the people of God can become desensitized to what God does in our lives. Even the people of God can become so desensitized to what God does in our life that we begin to ask God for more than what faith requires. Well, what, what does faith require? Faith does require evidence. It does require enough evidence that would be reasonable for belief, but faith does not require proof. Well, what does this look like? Well, look, we can pick a million dif different illustrations, but maybe it's along the lines of, God, I'm going to lay out a fleece. And if you prove yourself to me and do X, then I will trust you with Y. Right? God, if, if you... I know you've commanded me to be a witness, to be light to tell others about Christ, especially those in my own life. But I'm a little nervous about that, so I'm not going to say anything to my neighbor, to my uh, uh, relative, to my co-worker. I'm not going to say anything until they ask me. And if, they, and if you will make it so they will ask me, then I'll say something. Now, now hang on. Do you need proof from God that he wants you to be a witness, or can you take him at his word? Father, I, I know you've said that you will provide. I know that you've said that you take care of our needs. But if you will prove to me first by providing X, then I will, will fill in the blank, tithe. Then I will serve. Then I will go. Father, I, I know you care for me. I know that you love me. That's what your word says. And I, Lord, I guess I believe that. But before I'll really trust you, I need you to prove it to me. You see what I'm saying? This is leaven that affects our thinking. And Jesus told his disciples, be careful, it spreads. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful when you will not accept the evidence that God has already given. The desire for proof eliminates the need for faith. Faith will only offer sufficient reason to believe in Jesus. And if you cannot place your faith in Christ for what he has done, how will you ever claim to trust him? This is the problem with this leaven of the Pharisees. This is the problem with desiring what faith does not require, which is proof. This is the, this is the problem because how can you ever claim that you are going to trust God when you don't accept what He has already done. You cannot. I'm going to trust Christ with fill in the blank 
if he will do X. Has he already worked enough? Well, yes, I know. He's fed the multitudes and he's healed people and he's given sight to the blind and he's cast out demons. Yeah, he's done many other things, but I'll trust him if fill in the blank. Take the warning. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees because it will prevent you from seeing clearly, from seeing Jesus at work clearly in your life. I've never met a believer and I've rarely met a person who didn't want to see Jesus at work in their life, who really wanted to see that. But I've met a lot of people who say they struggle with that I've met a lot of people who say, you know, I, I, I don't know if I really can see God in my life. Could it be that you're asking for proof when God has already given you evidence? For me to not trust God in my life, I know for me personally, I would have to overlook a whole lot of evidence. Well, things haven't always turned out the way I wanted them to. (laughs) Surprise. It's called life. But if I think back on my life, and if I think back on my childhood and the way God took care of my parents, and if I think back on how God's taken care of people for generations since the beginning of time, there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of evidence that He actually does keep His word that he actually does care for us. So when I find myself struggling to see God at work in my life, the first thing I need to ask is, am I desiring more than what faith offers? Faith offers to meet you where the evidence points to Jesus Christ. But faith does not offer proof. The minute you have proof, you have no need of faith. But as they enter into the boat, and and as the story continues, Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And some face palms were happening in the boat. We forgot the bread. What, Peter, were you, you forgot the bread. And they had one loaf. We have no bread. We have no bread. He's, he's, he's upset, and Jesus is giving us signals that he's upset because he's talking about leaven, and he really wants us to know that he noticed the fact that we dropped the ball and we don't have bread. That's literally the conversation. That's literally what happens here. We have no bread. We just have one loaf and Jesus. <laughs> that should be enough, but that's all they can think about, Right? When Jesus attempted to address a problem that required spiritual insight, the disciples saw too little spiritual application and settled for a solution apart from Jesus. Here's the Pharisees. They expected too much of faith. We want proof. Here's the disciples. They're, all, they're at the other end of the spectrum. The pendulum has swung all the way to the other side, and now they expect too little out of life and their relationship with Christ. They don't even factor in Jesus into their solutions. All they see is what's in their hand. One loaf. Not even enough to feed Peter. There's just not enough here. We dropped the ball. They're having a hard time seeing clearly who's in the boat. Wouldn't you agree? They're having a hard time seeing clearly that Jesus is with them and who he is. Why? What would prevent the disciples from seeing Jesus clearly? I give you the second point. Settling for less than faith demands. If desiring more than faith offers can prevent you from seeing clearly, seeing Jesus clearly, then settling for less than faith demands can also prevent you from seeing clearly God's hand in your life. What do you mean settling for less than faith demands? Well, the problem here was the disciples were content to believe in what Jesus did without making the effort to trust him for what he could do. Now, unlike the Pharisees, they had no problem believing in Jesus. They were in the boat. They were believers. They believed. They believed in Jesus. But they made no effort 
Even though they believed what he did, they made no effort to trust Jesus for what he could do. Does that make sense? You guys following me? They, look, it, it was like James said in the book of James. He said, um, you believe that there's a God, you're doing good. The devils also believe and tremble. Belief is not enough. Belief must translate into trust, which is, which is faith in action, is it not? That what they lacked was trust. What they lacked was actionable trust in what God can do. So Jesus had to pause one conversation about desiring more than faith offers to address their problem for settling for less than faith demands. And he begins to berate them with nine successive questions. Can you not see? Can you not hear? Let me just read it. It's pretty rough. This is a rough day. Rough day. And he says in verse 17, And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because we have no bread? Listen, listen to this. This, this is pretty rough. Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, hear ye not. And do ye not remember? <laughs> it's like Jesus said. You've got all these faculties and every single one of them points to me. Did you not pay attention to anything? Ouch. <laughs> but that's exactly what happened. Jesus defines outsiders, does he not? In Mark chapter 4, verse 12, listen to how Jesus defines outsiders. Mark chapter 4, verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should convert, be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Jesus defines outsiders in 412 as those who see but do not perceive and those who hear but do not understand. Now he's saying to his disciples that their reaction to his miracles makes them no different. Right? The disciples react to his miracles like outsiders who don't have a relationship with him. This really needs to sink in here. Stay with me. They're, they're treating Jesus like an outsider who has no relationship with him because it is true, good relationships are built on trust, not just belief. Good relationships are built on trust, are they not? It takes more than belief. If you want a good relationship with someone, you've got to have a little trust. How many here are married and you trust that your spouse is faithful? You better raise your hand. <laughs> this is the time you better be awake, right? You trust that your spouse is faithful. I'm glad you should because good relationships are built on trust. Now, what if you were to say, I trust my wife and I'll tell you why. I've hired a private investigator and he's tracked her down and watched her every move and I can confirm she's trustworthy. Well, you could do that if you want, but something tells me that's going to destroy your relationship because there's no trust, right? You can hire a private investigator to gather indisputable proof that your spouse is faithful, but doing this would shatter your relationship that is supposed to be based on love and trust. If you have no trust, you have no relationship. You guys with me? You guys awake? Too much turkey. It's just like, it's still settling in the gut. That, that uh, is putting, is it melatonin comes from? I don't know. Sleepy crowd, sleepy crowd. If you have no trust, you have no relationship. Right? Well, I, I, no, I, I, there's some things I struggle with trusting God about, but I believe in him. What good is that? What good is that if you don't trust? Look, you can settle for less than faith demands and ruin your relationship and not perceive what God is doing in your life. How could they miss it? They're in the boat with Jesus, the guy who just took a few loaves and fish and fed multitudes, and they're worried he can't feed them? They're, they're, they're worried about food? 
What's missing? It's not belief. Jesus questioned him about that. He says, how many, how many baskets were after the first? Twelve. How many baskets were after the second miracle? Seven. It's not like they didn't believe, but they didn't trust. They believed what God had done, but that never translated and trust for what he could do. You have no relationship if you cannot trust. But that's what happens when you settle for less than faith demands. Faith demands more than belief, as James said. Faith demands works. It demands action. It demands trust. Settling for belief in Jesus will not meet the requirement of faith without active trust. If you cannot trust Christ for what He will do, how can you say you have placed your faith in what He has done? Right? Do I need to say it again? Let me say it again. If you cannot trust Christ for what He will do, how can you say you have placed your faith in what He has done? How can you claim to have a relationship with Christ where you believe in Him and you lack the trust for what He will do? Either you believe and you trust Him or you don't believe and you don't trust Him. Be, beware, beware of this leaven that creeps in and destroys our faith. It can, it can, it can make you blind and deaf. It can harden your heart to God at work in your life when you demand more than faith offers, when you're demanding proof, or when you settle for less than faith demands and you settle with, with belief without trust. It can make you blind to what God is doing in your life. I have no idea how this applies to any of you, but I know this is the text this morning. And I know it says this very thing. And I know there is a problem here of blindness and deafness. You can't hear, you can't see. Your heart is hardened because you've asked more than what God is willing to give or you've offered less than what God demands. And in either case, it makes you blind or you cannot see what God is doing. But here's the problem. We all want to see God work in our life. We all do. So I'm going to ask a question and I need an answer. Can you see him at work in your life? You know, sometimes we actually think, sometimes we actually think, well, there are times he does and there are times he doesn't. Let me follow that up. I can see you chewing on it. Well, there are times God lets me walk alone. I can experience life without Him. There are droughts in my life and times where, well, God's, you know, I just can't find Him anywhere. Really? Really? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. There, there are really times God's not at work? Is, is that the issue? Oh, I, just, I just don't feel close to God. I, I just can't find God. I don't know where he's at. I don't know what he's doing in my life. I, I understand that. I understand there are times I don't know what he's doing in my life. But to say he's not around, could it be that he's not around or could it be that you don't see him at work. Well, no, because if he was at work, I'd see it, really. You'd, maybe if God fed 4,000 men and women and children, it would be so obvious. No one could possibly miss that, like the Pharisees or Jesus' own disciples. I mean, how could you ever miss such a thing if God was at work in your life? So he must not be. Friend, you see the problem? We all want God to be at work in our life. We all want God to be at work in our life. But the problem is not that he's not at work. The problem is we can't see it. And the reason 
in many cases is because we ask too much. We want God to prove himself when he's already provided enough evidence, reasonable evidence for faith. Or we settle for belief with no trust. We'll believe what God has done in our life without any trust in what he can do. And so, we hear no miracle, we see no miracle. We're blind to it. We miss it. Every head bowed, every eye closed.